I, I don't know if you've, if you've noticed, but things are dark. Things are dark over there. And things are bleak. And things are bleak on our border. Things are bleak on our health care system. Things are bleak in our pipelines, in our cyberspace. It's all under attack. I watched this afternoon while within one hour of a report, the reporter stood there and pointed to the sign over his shoulder, which was one of those electronic gas prices that went from 124 to 389 within the hour. The gas prices went up that high. And yet we're closing pipelines and we're stopping production and we're selling out to others. Things are dark and things are bleak. We know that. They really, really are. There is a darkness in the land. There's no doubt about it. <clears throat> but we know that with every darkness, it just takes a little bit of light to make something happen. Doesn't take much light to make the darkness go away. Amen? Amen. So I want you to turn to Genesis 1-1 one, one with me. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I want to say amen? amen? All right. There was no Big Bang mentioned there, by the way. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void and darkness. Everybody say darkness. Darkness, darkness was over the surface of the deep. Now remember, nothing had been created on earth to separate water, land, soil, sky, nothing. All there was was deep. All of creation was the depth of the presence of God. And there was a darkness that was over the entire surface of all that there was. Things were dark. Things were without form and void. Things were out of control. Things were a bit chaotic. But the next line says, the Spirit of God was moving over the surface. I want to remind you that when it's dark, God is still moving. He is still moving. Even though it's dark, God is still present and bringing the light to our world. Let's look at some things that happen in darkness. Number one, in darkness we anchor. What does that mean? Well, a ship that sails on stormy waters tries to get as far as they possibly can during the daylight, right? But if it's too stormy, they had better anchor for the night because they can't tell where the rocks are, where the, where the sandbars are, where things are, because if you're any kind of a sailor at all, on any kind of waters at all, you know that things move and things change. Even if you go up and down a river day after day after day, you have to be careful that logs haven't moved, that rocks haven't bumped up against other rocks, and that things haven't shifted and changed. And what wasn't a threat yesterday could be a threat today. And so standing at the keel of the boat and watching as you pilot your boat through that river, you still are looking forward to see what's coming up. You've got to be aware. But at night, how do you do that in the dark of night? You see, in the dark of night, the safest thing to do is to drop anchor. Just drop anchor. Just stop for a moment and say, I'm going to drop anchor. Look at Hebrews 6.19 with me. Hebrews 6.19. Hebrews 6, if we start with 17, get a run and start. In the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise, and one who's the heir of the promise of Abraham, okay, the unchangeableness of his purpose, God does not change, right? God wants to show us 2,000 years later, that he's the same God that was with Jesus when he was here. And he wants to show us that he's the same God who was with Abraham 4,000 years ago, with David 3,000 years ago. 
He wants to show us his unchangeableness in purpose, interposed with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. In other words, he's got more than two witnesses that will attest to the fact God does not lie. He can bring two people, more than two people into court, but it only takes two to believe. So, it is impossible for God to lie. We who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope that is set before us. When there is darkness, you must remember that we are the children of hope. We are the people of hope. There is a hope that is set before us. And verse 19, our key verse says, This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. Whoa. Within the Holy of Holies, that anchor, that one, that hope that is sure and steadfast. In other words, when it's darkest, we know that it's bright on the other side because he is unchanging. There's a thing in psychology that we call object permanence with children. There's a period of time in which you can take a baby. I think I talked about this in one of our previous studies where you can take a toy and, and show the baby the rattle. And you show the baby the rattle and they reach for it and they chew on it and then you take it away from them and you show it to them and they reach for it and they chew on it for a while. And you take that and then you take a washcloth and you put it underneath the washcloth. There's a certain age where the baby will believe that out of sight is out of existence. That it will just look around and go, well, okay, now what do you want to do? The rattle left, it's gone, it's over, it's kaput. Even though you saw, the baby saw you put it under the washcloth, it does not have the logical connections in its brain yet to say, just because I don't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. If I don't see it, it doesn't exist. That's where their logic is. That's where their brain is. But there will be a day. There will be a day in their development when you put it underneath the washcloth and they will reach over and they will pull it off and look at you like, look how smart I am. Look what I found, see? You didn't fool me. They know that, don't they? How many of you know that sometimes the devil can bring darkness over our life and we totally forget that God ceased to exist? We forget the object permanence that on the other side of this washcloth is all the light we will ever need. Outside the tunnel of a train track, there is all the sunshine that you will ever need. On the other side of a cloud bank is all the sun that will ever exist. It always exists. It never changes. It's going to be there. Just because it is not obvious to you at the moment because of darkness does not mean that the unchangeableness of God has been changed, but that his brightness will shine on whether you can see it or not. That's exactly what's being said here. That is exactly what we're being told. And we are being told, well, when you're in a storm, this is your anchor. This is your anchor. Look at verse 19. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. The two who have no beginning and no end, will, they're not going anywhere. Amen. I saw some old westerns over the weekend. I was taping off the Magnificent Seven series for Dad putting them on disc form. Magnificent 1 through 300. <laughs> uh, magnificent 7 1, Magnificent 7 2, Magnificent 7 3, you know, they, they ride, they fall, they shoot, they jump. Magnificent 7 rides, they shoot, they jump. Uh, every one of those. And, and, you know, as I'm watching those over and over and over again, sometimes the same story it seemed like, over and over again, as I watch that Magnificent 7, those, those movies, the one thing that always, always, always uh, came through was that good people will get good in the end. 
And I thought, well, a lot of people died. A lot of the, you know, the seven came down to like three at the end or something like that. And they all passed away. And then I thought, wait a minute. In the Christian story, to be here is good, but to be with the Lord is better. And so we have an anchor that he is unchanging and that just like a good Roy Rogers movie, the white hats do win in the end. Now I want you to personalize that. Are you dark about your finances? Are you dark about your future? Are you dark about your health? Is there a darkness over your health? Is there a darkness over something you've done in the past or need to do in the future, something you struggle over, some kind of sin that you have hidden or some chain that's on your foot that you keep dragging along? Whatever the darkness is in your life, I am here to tell you that it is just a washcloth separating you from the light of God. That's all it is. It's just keeping you from the light. Look at Romans 8.31. Oh, brother, it's dark out there. It's scary. It's bleak. I don't know whether to turn left or right, up or down. It's scary. Look at Romans 8, 31. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Is there anything in the universe of all creation that can put a dimmer switch on the light of God? Is there anything that could diminish the light of God? How much time do we worry about the darkness when we have been assured that the light is unchanging and is unending? It is unchanging. It is totally unending. But look down just a little bit at verse 37. But in all these things, say all. all. In all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer. say it. Conquer. conquer. In all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. You see, again, it's not us, it's the light. It's the light of God that gets us through. And that never wavers. We may think we are in a dark space in America today. We may think that we're in a dark space in the global story. But how many of you know that to God, this is not even an eyelash on the flea, on the hair, on the back of a frog. Is he shocked by any of this? Is he surprised by any of this? Is he troubled by any of this? Then shouldn't we have the same mind that Christ has? Shouldn't we have the same mind? Psalm 27, 13 through 14. It says, I would have despised unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait. Anchor. Stop. Put down the anchor. Quit running around like a chicken with your head cut off. Drop the anchor. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take Courage, yes, wait for the Lord. Now, if you look at verse 10, 11, and 12, it tells you what he's talking about. 10 says, For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a level path because of my foes. Do not deliver me over to the desires of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have despaired. He's got, a, he's got himself a problem now. He is living in a troubled world. Things are not going his way and he's not having the best day. 
But you know what? Those three verses don't really matter as to what we plug in there because 13 and 14 still takes care of them. You see? I mean, that's his circumstance. That's his circumstance that God's going to step into and fix. But you put your circumstances in there, and you write in what your problems are, and you take the darkness that you face and the darkness that you have and the darkness which descends on you and the darkness which comes at you in the middle of the night and makes you feel lower than a snail and makes you feel unworthy and makes you feel unloved and makes you feel like God doesn't remember you. And whatever it is that takes you down into the darkness, you write that in there, and then you finish it by saying... I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. For the Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Yes, I wait for the Lord. Whatever your circumstances are, 13 and 14 trumpet. 13 and 14 beat it every time. And so you can take this and you can live on it. And you can live in it. And so we're going to make the darkness flee. Well, I've got two more to talk about. But next week we won't look at videos. We'll just jump right into it and finish them up, okay? But we're out of time now. So this is number one. Number one is this. But we'll get into the darkness again next week.